Hello all. So this is the solution to the fourth question on the second class mechanics homework. This question comes from the Taylor textbook. So the premise of this question is that a golf ball is hit at some angle with some initial velocity and we need to calculate some aspects about its flight path. So we're given some initial conditions. We're told that the golf ball starts at the origin and it's a given some initial velocity in the x and the z axis with nothing in the y axis. So just as a note, we're defining our coordinate system to look like this, where z is upwards and x and y are different directions on the ground. This is probably a little bit different from how most of you did these projectile motion problems in physics 183. But note that the choice of axes is completely arbitrary. I could have my x-axis pointing up in the air, and all it would change is what component goes in what spot of a vector. It doesn't change sort of the math or the physics at all. So anytime you're doing a problem in physics, your choice of origin is completely arbitrary. Your choice of orientation of your axes is completely arbitrary. There just may occasionally be cases where one choice of origin or one choice of axis orientation is Simpl it simplifies your problem sum. So in this case, it simplifies my problem sum if my uh, golf ball starts at the origin, but which axis I have pointing up doesn't really matter much. So given the initial velocities only in the x and the z axis, I can split it up into components like this. So no velocity in the y, and then the velocity in the x is the initial speed times the cosine of the angle which is hit at. And the velocity in the z-axis is the initial speed times the sine of the angle, which is hit at, which again, very similar to what you've seen in physics 183. You probably just had this as the y-axis though. So how I like to start these problems is first write down the forces in all of the components and then the accelerations for all the components, then the velocities per component and then the positions per component. So if we go through and do those four steps, we have that, if I draw a little force diagram, the only force acting on it once it's been hit is gravity pointing straight downwards, assuming there's no air resistance, which is typically the simplest assumption. So I only have a force acting in the negative z direction. So my uh, x component of force is zero, my y component of force is zero, and my z component of force is gravity, so that's negative mg. To get acceleration from force, you simply divide by the mass. So zero divided by the mass is still zero. So these two components remain zero for the acceleration. And then negative mg divided by mass is simply negative g. So I do have an acceleration in the z direction of negative g. g here being positive 9.81. I like to keep the negative sign outside of the constant so I can see it. To get velocity from acceleration, you simply integrate. So the integral, so the velocity in the x direction is the integral of the acceleration in the x direction, which is zero plus a constant. That constant is almost always going to be the initial conditions. And since I do have an initial velocity in the x direction, that constant is that initial velocity. So I end up with the velocity in the x direction simply being the initial speed times cosine of the angle, which makes sense since there's no forces acting in the x direction, the speed in the x direction should not change. For the y velocity, the integral of the acceleration in the y direction or the integral of zero is zero plus the initial uh, velocity, which in this case is zero. So the entire velocity is zero. And finally, for the z direction, we can find the velocity by integrating the acceleration in the z direction. So the integral of negative g is negative gt plus a constant. We do have an initial velocity in the z direction. So our total velocity in the z direction becomes negative gt plus the initial velocity sine of theta. And finally, to get position from velocity, you just take the integral again. So the position for the x component as a function of time is simply the integral of the x velocity with respect to time. So we get the initial velocity cosine of theta t plus a constant, 
we're starting in an origin. So all three constants of integration. So all three for each of the positions are gonna be zero. So we don't have to worry about those. So my equation for X position as a function of time is the initial velocity cosine of theta times T. For Y, we have the integral of the Y velocity, which is zero. So my Y position is zero. So that doesn't change what fits the set of my problem, which is that there's only motion in the X and the Z direction. And finally, the position in the Z direction is the integral of the velocity in the Z direction which gives me negative g over 2t squared plus the initial velocity sine of theta t. So now I have that set up. All four of these sort of sections set up, I can very easily solve for what it wants. So the first part of this problem wants you to write a vector that represents the position of the golf ball as a function of time. So all you do here is grab your three component positions and write them in a vector. So instead of writing it sort of as a vector within brackets, I chose to write it with unit vectors, where EX is the unit vector in the X direction, EY is the unit vector in the Y direction, and EZ is the unit vector in the Z direction. So the next part of this problem wants you to find the time at which the golf ball will reach the ground. So the golf ball will reach the ground when its Z position is zero. So z equals zero is the ground in this setup. So to find that time, I simply take my equation for the z position as a function of time, which I have derived up here. I set it equal to zero right here, and then I solve for t. So to solve for t, I factored out a t from each of these terms since they each contain a t. And then you divide that t over. Zero divided by t is still zero. So I'm left with this more simple expression here. And then I subtract over this term to get this, divide by this term so the signs cancel out. And I'm left with uh, the final time. So the time at which it hits the ground is two times the initial velocity sine of theta over G. And remember here, I'm defining G to be a positive number, positive 9.81. Just so if you define g to be a negative number, you will have a minus sign here. Just remember that it'll cancel with the minus sign hidden in this variable. So the last thing this problem wants you to find is the uh, how far the ball goes in that amount of time. So we know that it doesn't move in the y direction. So the y position for every time, including the final time, is zero. The condition for the final time is that the Z component of position is zero. So the only one left to find is the X component, which is sort of the distance it's traveled. So to do this, I need a uh, equation for the X position as a function of time, which I have very luckily derived over here. And so I just take that and I plug in the final time I just derived into this equation and I do a little simplification and I get my answer. So for this question, it's perfectly okay to leave your answer in this form. Or if you like, you can use this trig identity and simplify it a little bit more so that you only have sort of one trig function there. Either of these answers are fine. I think this is listed as the final answer in the solution Morton posted, but either of these two are perfectly fine. So let me know if you have any questions, but I hope this helped you understand the problem better.